Good morning. So we have efficiency and cost effectiveness. Very easy topics. <laughs> Very easy topics. Um, now, truly a challenge and a challenge in bu public sector and a challenge in California and a challenge to achieve those in project delivery in light of project quality, in light of stakeholder satisfaction, safety, uh, many other issues. So as Ken said, I'm Kristen Deshay and I am a director of product strategy with Oracle. But, and I'm very excited to have the panel that I have here today, and I'm happy to hear what they have to say on the topic, as I'm sure you all are. So I'm just gonna jump in. I'm gonna ask each of them to go ahead and introduce themselves and what agency they're working with and what they're working on, and then we'll jump into the questions. So go ahead. <laughs> Hi, my name is Geraldine Otero. I work for Metrolink. Um, I'm a project manager there, and my real title is <laughs> Rail Civil Engineer 2. Um, currently, I'm working on um, the LAUS uh, Rail Yard Modernization and Rehabilitation. It's a years-long project that's been trying to bring the, uh, the Union Station up to code and, and also um, in preparation for the Metro's Link US project. So yeah, that's one of the big ones I'm working on. There's a smattering of little other projects, but. Good morning, everyone. I'm May Hikar. OK, I'll try again. Good morning, everyone. I'm May Hatar from the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California. Uh, Metropolitan was founded 95 years ago to design, build, and operate the Colorado River Aqueduct to bring water from Lake Mead into Southern California. Uh, we still do that today, and we also receive water from the state project water system from Northern California. Through our 26 member agencies, we deliver that to 19 million people. So um, what do I do? I'm pretty busy in, in engineering. We're managing our capital projects to keep that aging infrastructure operating reliably and really looking forward to the planning of our pure water, Southern California, that will be uh, a major recycled water program. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. So nice to see so, so many infrastructure enthusiasts here. My name is Sunny Zia, and I'm with the Port of Long Beach. I am a project manager, program manager, senior civil engineer. Although I have a love and hate relationship with the senior part. Um, I've been with the port for the past 16 years, um, and prior to that, uh, worked for the military and private sector. Um, so what I do um, at the port, I oversee a capital improvement projects, some of our capital improvement projects, and um, in my uh, past life at the port, um, I also had the role of being the internal auditor because of our construction projects uh, that we led. I set it up. Um, I helped set it up and I led that effort um, so we can oversee and audit our improvement pro projects, capital improvement projects. So I've overseen about $2.4 billion of expenditures in that realm. So both finance uh, from a finance perspective and also the actual project delivery side, um, that's what my experience uh, uh, includes. And um, I'm really looking forward to connecting with you all, learning about you and my um, uh, current projects and programs. So I worked on rail, dredging, roadway, um, and the prospective programs that uh, um, is in the horizon is um, our stormwater infrastructure projects. So that's gonna be huge, and I'm happy to tra traverse that terrain along with other capital movement projects and domains with you as we plow through the thicket of this great panel, and it's an honor to be here with uh, an all-woman panel. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bethana Cornett. I'm a senior planner with the city of Santa Barbara. I focus, I'm actually in the public works department and not our community development department, so I actually focus on helping facilitate the planning aspects of all of our capital program. We're a full service city. We have our own uh, wastewater treatment plant. We have a desalination facility. We 
have reservoirs on, and a connection to Lake Kachuma and other, other resources. Um, so we are constantly, you know, we're doing repair and maintenance on our existing infrastructure and then upgrades to the desal facility uh, is one of the aspects that I support. I also support the dredging of our harbor um, and different operations associated with beach nourishment. Um, I also focus a little bit on some airport it, improvements that are going on. And so I kind of have a, a pretty broad job. Um, my background is in environmental. I've, I've worked in engineering firms for about 20 years prior to joining the city. Um, so I come from the private sector. Um, kind of one of my goals is to help uh, diversify our consultant pool and help improve productivity of the deliverables and the quality of the deliverables received by the city and being more creative about the implementation of projects and, and kind of thinking through the environmental side early and like a kind of a more team approach early and often versus a last minute, let's deal with environmental approach. So thanks. So let's go ahead and, and stay with you, Beth Anna. Um, <laughs> tell sure. us more about the, the city of Santa Barbara. How are you involving planners earlier? Mm -hmm. How are you working on the, the cost effectiveness? Um, so so I actually sit, as, as a planner, I actually, I run a little group called Special Projects. We actually sit within the engineering group. Uh, we have about 70 in, people in our engineering team. Um, and so we actually, are integrally involved in just the project conception all the way through, you know, original, you know, conception, 30% design, 60% design, we're taking it and we're actually getting the regulatory agency permits, doing pr practical early consultation with regulators, Army Corps Regional Board, Fish and Wildlife, U.S. Fish, Fish and Game, it's all the players. Uh, we have a lot of endangered species in our area. Um, so we have to we have to think about that because we can make we can design an unbuildable project really easily, um, and so we try really hard to be involved early and and have be kind of like have a seat at the table um, versus being an afterthought. So that's that's the innovation I I find that it's like really exciting about being in this group and in that that team. Thank you. Sunny, how about you? How about with the Port of Long Beach? How, what are you doing to, to work on fiscal responsibility? Thank you. Uh, this is one of my favorite questions. Um, what are we doing as far as fiscal pr prudence and responsibility? Um, before I um, dive into that, I want to recognize a couple of folks. Um, we have Carrie Juro in the uh, crowd with the Port of Long Beach. She's our superstar communications director. Um, and I also want to um, recognize our former director who's here, Tasha Higgins, who had a birthday yesterday. Happy belated birthday, Tasha. Um, as far as fiscal prudence um, is concerned, and if, and if I'm missing any other Port of Long Beach peeps, I'm sorry, I can't see you from here. Um, uh, we are very much about maintaining our financial and fiscal assets um, and how we do that is really um, ensuring that our projects are delivered on time under budget and also we have quality contractors who can deliver. Um, and I know um, we're gonna get into this but one of the things that we were able to do is really look at in the world in the realm of public contracting code, how can we hire contractors with the low bid system and make sure they're quality and they have the fitness and capacity and experience. Um, and that was something that I was proud to work on and help lead the organization and of course under the leadership of our um, Board of Harbor Commission and they passed this policy where we pre-qualify contractors so that they are um, they're not committing wage theft, they're not change order happy, they're not claims happy. At the same time, we're also maintaining uh, efficiency and are effective with our programs. Um, so with that, you know, that has been really successful for us. Um, and we have also had our Board of Harbor Commission, uh, who's our governance body, pass um, a community um, workforce 
agreement or a project labor agreement which applies to these um, programs and projects so that we can make sure we get quality contractors and quality labor force. And I see um, the Southwest Carpenters are in the house. I see Jesse over there. Um, they're, they're, it's been a really successful partnership for us in maintaining that fiscal prudence, having no strikes, and then making sure that the projects are not just delivered on time and on budget, but it's quality and in perpetuity, we can maintain them and protect our assets. So I'm, I'm happy to answer um, if I've, I haven't covered anything else, but I think that's pretty much the gist. No, that's just good. Good to hear. What about, to stay with you, what about the, the impact on local economy? The, the impact, impact on local projects. economy. So first of all, how many, if you're uh, in the port sector, um, you can't, um, Cheat. So, um, how many of you know what the port actually does? I see, speaking of the port, I see Rajiv just walked in. Um, welcome, Rajiv. Um, sir, you, what, what do you think we do at the port? At the port administration side, I'm not talking about the commerce aspect. How do we make our money? That's a good question, but how do we do that? How do we, like, how, ostensibly, we're owner developers. So we make land out of water, that's the gist of it. And then we, we lease them out and we really get the revenue from that uh, aspect. Um, and the reason why, it's, it's wonderful working for a <laughs> very wealthy owner developer, we have our own funds. So it, we're an enterprise fund, we're not a general fund. Meaning we're not um, at the mercy of um, tax payers' dollars. We generate our own funds by making land, making wharves, um, and then leasing it out to the terminal operator operators or the shipping companies. And um, the more we do that, the more revenue we generate. So what does that mean for the local economy and the community? That means one out of five jobs, and this is um, going to be updated soon, uh, is attributed to the, the port of Lamy. So what that means is that the success of the port is the success of the city and the region. And in millions of dollars, just out of our project labor agreements, this is just the statistics that we recently reported um, with the workforce development aspect, we have generated over $423.5 million in wage, um, wa wage workers' um, profit, um, earnings. And that's about, 15,000 people we've employed. And this is just some of our projects. So that, that's what gives me hope, and that's what is my purpose at the port. I fell in love with it because, you know, if you come to Long Beach, you see um, it's real America. Unfortunately, you see the economic disparity and the income gap, and it's the quintessential haves and have-nots. But to be able to do something about it and work for an agency where I have a, perhaps an infinitesimal role in making an impact in that community, that's what the port does. And not just for the city, but writ large for the region. Um, and I'm proud to be able to serve an organization that does that. Um, we're gonna be updating our numbers, but that's just some of the examples of the um, impact. And we also have partnerships um, so that we're building a pipeline so we can get work, good workforce in perpetuity and make sure our posterity is left at a good place. Meaning, so how can we attract talent? We have a deficit in the blue collar jobs and the people who are gonna actually do the work. Um, and that's what we're working on with our partners. I also serve, um, I have, I'm a low level public servant uh, uh, at the Community College Board of Trustees for the past 10 years. And we have a partnership with them um, in making sure we have students come and learn about maritime sector programs so that in, we're building that pipeline and making sure that we're taking care of as far as the workforce goes and our projects are handled with quality uh, under budget and on time. Thank you, thank you. May, we, we heard a little bit about alternative delivery in the, in the last panel, and I just wanna ask you, how is Metropolitan deciding to take that on and preparing maybe for your first projects? 
Yeah, thank you. Um, it, it's for a lot of the reasons that you just heard. We're looking right now, if, for those of you who live here in Southern California, we, we go from extreme drought to extreme flood years, right? There's no average years anymore. So we're looking at our 95-year-old system and figuring out what do we need to do to adapt to climate change. And we combine that with the challenges of not being a burden on the ratepayers. You know, we, we can't, ch as we're asking people to use less and less water, we can't just charge them more and more for that less water. So what do you do about that? We're looking at a couple things, and that's doing the right projects, but really moving to um, collaborative delivery methods and progressive design build so that we can do our work more efficiently and still get the projects we need. So we got specific legislation that allowed us to use progressive design build, CM CMGC and design build for drought projects and for pure water Southern California. So we've started on the first drought project and I know we already talked about people doing work on Sepulveda Boulevard, but so are we. We are going to be taking our, exi our existing pipe that flows water from Granada Hills down into the central part of, Cal of, of LA. We're gonna be pumping that water back up now. And that gives us the flexibility to move water that came in from the Colorado River water o over to Oxnard and areas like that. So that's an exciting project. We're learning a lot about progressive design build as we do that. Um, afterwards, I can give you a lot of our lessons learned. It's something we take really seriously. We're, so far, we've been through the procurement stage. We're working with a contractor. We're part of the way through phase one on our first project. And like I said, we, we've got lot, a lot of lessons learned I'd be happy to talk to you all about. But so far, we're really good. We're very optimistic. We're gonna start another uh, rehabilitation project using progressive design build, and we are planning on using both progressive design build for the treatment of pure water and CMGC probably for a lot of the uh, pipeline distribution segments for pure water. Great, great to hear. Um, how are you working with the communities the, that you're affecting and how are you partnering with them yeah, on that? That's really key to everything we're doing right now. Um, at, with the Pure Water Project um, in particular, right now we're thinking that's about a $6.4 billion project. Our board is really committed to 25% small businesses and that's both um, through design and through construction for all phases of the work. Well. You know, that's what well over a billion dollars, right? Of, of, and we're, we're finding, just as you heard in the e earlier panel, that those resources aren't out there. So we've got active efforts right now. We've got our, our MetWorks program. We had about 600 people um, in a conference room in Carson trying to work on teaming up large contractors with um, small business firms so that they um, know each other, can work together, and know what's coming up for Metropolitan. And by the way, we have an app for that, and you don't even have to go to the conference. You can sign up for something we call our MetWorks Bench and participate through that. And also really doing outreach um, to try to develop our pre-apprenticeship pre workforce programs. We do have a project labor agreement um, that we're coordinating that with. So, Great to hear. Geraldine, let, let's talk about Metrolink a little bit. So we've had a lot of conversations about the Olympics. How are how are you guys preparing for the Olympics? Yeah, so we have our SCORE program. It's Southern California Optimized Rail Expansion Project. It's a $10 billion program um, that's already started. It's kind of going through phases. We finished... Uh, a couple of projects already. Um, Burbank is one. Um, Avery de Song signal improvement. So the whole project is um, signal improvements, station improvements, fleet supplemental to try to get te uh, 30 minute headways in pre preparation for the Olympics. So I mean, Metrolink crosses like six counties. We have seven lines 
67 stations throughout Southern California. So, and then a big push is also um, strategically placed sightings so that, you know, uh, trains can pass each other and then we can get those 30 minute headways. So um, currently the, we have a bundled project uh, on our San Gabriel line, on San Bernardino line um, that's gonna be out, I think the end of this year, beginning of next year. So uh, you can go on Planet Bids on our Metrolink website to see that. But uh, yeah, it's a huge push that we're doing and we're working with, you know, counties, all of the transit commissions, and then also cities. So yeah, we're trying to really push for the 2028, and then also FIFA as well. So, so how does risk factor in, and how do you, how do you manage risk? So um, a little bit about my role, I didn't really go into it, but I work on the construction side. Uh, how our program delivery department works is we have a design uh, team and then it goes into our construction team and we are we are involved early in the design as well because you know if you can't construct a <laughs> a project that's already been designed you know what what's the point <laughs> so um, we we have on rail there's our trains go 79 miles per hour. So there's a lot of risk in having workers out there in the middle of all that. And part of my job is, because um, I work with third party agencies, so I work with cities that kind of don't understand sometimes the risk in working next to rail. Um, so we have RWP training, that's roadway, roadway worker uh, training and um, any kind of person, employee that ever fouls the track needs to go through this training process. Each day when we do um, work, we have a job briefing that says, what are your limits? What is your protection on the track? Um, what kind of work you're doing so that there's no kind of incident that happens. Um, and I think that's something that some contractors is a learning curve because uh, when, yeah, it's one thing to work on a project that there's, you know, uh, no real risk on cars and stuff because they're, it's all out of the way. Trains have to go. <laughs> we have to, we have to, yeah, we have to, um, you know, uh, but we have passengers to 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 deliver to the station, so um, our trains must go forth. And uh, we have, when working with Metrolink, we uh, we have selected limited um, work windows that are are um, where our work is suspended, so they can get their work done. So. That is something uh, that we have to plan for. It's a year before you have to have to set these work windows before um, uh, very early on, and we just hope that uh, you know that when contractors come and work with us, it's you know a happy process. We we work together, and um, there's no incidents or risk. Or there's always going to be risk, but th th there's no incidents. Well, you brought up something about working with all of those different counties that that Metrolink crosses. Um, how about everybody else? How about interagency? Um, how do you deal with that, Bethanna? Interagency um, communication and planning. Um, yeah, so I work. I actually liaison with the Coastal Commission, all the agencies I mentioned previously. Um, the way that we've structured it is that, that I, on a re, from a regulatory perspective for permitting, I'm the lease, like I'm the single point of contact for all those agencies with our department. Um, so there's like a very clear line of communication and not all the engineers individually contacting a regulator to get an input on a project. 
I don't do that on behalf of Caltrans because that's the the, it, the engineers work directly with Caltrans. But for all of the sort of um, other state lands commission as well, the coastal commission, all of those folks, I, I liaison with them to get us you know one set of direction and then fight for consistency between our projects and consistency with other projects, um, and and just push to, uh, you know, most aggressively benefit the, the, me the me means and needs of our, our projects um, with, the, with those agencies. And sort of, it's a relationship building exercise, it's a collaboration, it's a trust exercise as well. You know, so we're constantly working to, to meet those expectations with our deliverables, our reporting requirements, or whatever those might be. Because if you miss your reporting requirements on the back end of a project, then the front end, when you're going in the next time, you're going you're going to have more stringent requirements and less trust, and maybe a shorter, for ex maybe a shorter permit window or shorter require shorter allowances to do your project, or or maybe even more mitigation required. So there there is a relationship between the two sides of a project. And, um, and we're not going away. Those are going to be our teaming partners. So, May, did you want to jump in there? Yeah, I, I what I did want to make clear is Metropolitan being a regional agency, we have our 26 member agencies. So all of the projects that we're working on are really collaborative with the local communities. And we really work with our member agencies and then in the local ju jurisdictions as we define our projects, as, as we get out to the community and explain them. And we feel that that's really the most important as you're defining the project early that you work with the community and get their input. Um, and then and you continue through the whole life of the project if people understand that through the design and through the, and through the construction management. So. Sure. Um, so there's um, just a dovetail. I don't want to. Um, sound uh, redundant. So we do have great um, relationships with our local and county and state level and also federal. So one of the um, projects that we're um, doing is the deep draft navigation project. So we're working with our counterparts in with the Army Corps, a project that I um, worked on in 2009 and managed. It was the uh, deepening of our main channel and Army Corps. And, and we had a um, relationship where it was a cost sharing agreement and I, ha I was tasked with the uh, internally intractable <laughs> um, task of negotiating <laughs> um, and we were able to uh, secure a great um, uh, cost sharing agreement. Um, it's similar to our public-private partnerships that we have um, but the agency part um, we're also embarking on um, seeking grants from some both federal and state um, projects that we're leading, um, one of which is the Pier Wind, which I'm sure you guys have all heard of. Um, and that has been a, a um, new ter terrain for us uh, that we're looking at um, and a great opportunity for us to um, really experiment and see, because we've always been in this, um, ethos and this uh, ecosystem of prosperity, but in the future, how can we fund a lot of these programs? And the funding aspect has been really ever-present lately. Um, I believe we're, in the past year, it was about $643 million that we were able to secure with our agencies that we work with um, and get those grants, both federal and state. Um, and it's been a great relationship. Um, from a regulatory standpoint, um, it's been um, fantastic and an ironclad relationship. And we, it sure is a good um, uh, place to be as an agency that is a public agency. So we get a little bit more reprieve than others. So there's a little bit more uh, fast track. And then also our city um, counterparts, I see Eric Lopez, who you, you'll hear from, there are great partners, there are another department. So when it comes to permitting, uh, when it comes to our uh, project delivery side, um, it's wonderful to have those type of team members be able to expedite, be able to effectively help us where there are kinks and red tape that we can remove. 
Um, so it's been a great experience and it's worked out so far. The grant piece, it's um, uh, something that we're gonna have to um, uh, re-examine -exam at some point and see how we're doing, but so far so good. So talking about sustainability and um, how, do, how are you dealing with that as it affects um, cost and efficiency of projects? Anyone can take that. So um, the city of Santa Barbara just spun off uh, about two, about four years ago, a, a separate department called Sustainability and Resilience. And their, their charge is to you know, meet the, the, the state goals as well as our own local goals. We've set more aggressive goals than the state's goals for reduction in greenhouse gases. Um, and so that department works on things for sea level rise or climate action plan and other things. It, it is a challenge with, with a, de a separate department creating goals that are then applied to another department and having you know, the right level of communication between the two, between the, all these levels of organization um, and the goals of the organization, like our goal in public works is to deliver pipes, you know, sewer pipes, roads, bridges, a desal facility, like all of these facilities, we're responsible for maintaining and delivering the facilities, you know, in the best best standards that we can, um, and then having the, the the added kind of possible burden of needing to be more sustainable in the you know resource practices of, of acquiring goods and services to do those projects. That's it's it's sort of. We have been doing it for a long time, and so in my mind, I think we've been doing a lot of things that are sustainable, just as p best practices of our engineering and design workload, because it's just the right thing to do, and we've already been doing it, and so now it's gonna be a matter of matching those policies up and making sure that we're doing what's reasonable from a cost-effective cost perspective, as well as implementation can the budget handle it? You know, it's it's going to be interesting to see what ha what really happens and how it changes project delivery, and maybe um, you know, maybe might result in delays of project delivery, might result in higher costs of project delivery, and is is the elected are the elected officials going to be willing to stand up and say, you know what, I really believe these policies need to be implemented at the level that it's going to cost us twice as much or you know some number more to do to deliver the project mm -hmm. so it's I think I think it kind of comes down a little bit to that political level and also the policies themselves and how we interpret them um, and interpret them over time and if they're like a ramping up policy or just a bright line you know thou must do this forever going forward mm -hmm. so I think we're all, you know, working, you know, to address climate change, and um, it's it's a slow. I think we're pivoting. I think we're in a time of change, and uh, business as usual is no longer acceptable. So um, I also think, like what's been talked about about public outreach. Um, you know, we have a public outreach professional that works on behalf of our department. We also reach out to our community members and constituents for pro at the project level, and then do lots of communication at the citywide level, um, and and then, you know, lots of this you know the standard business stuff of like PR hiring PR firms to help manage the perception of of larger capital projects that might impact a. We have a really affluent community, so um, we're a very mobilized community. So we have to be really cautious when thinking about doing a project, even just having like surveyors on a site that people might notice. So <laughs> it's, we, get, we get involved early um, and that really helps a lot, so thank you. Yeah, I would suggest putting LIDAR on a truck, they might not notice. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I really, I wanted to echo everything you said that's um, what's going on at Metropolitan Water District. Also, we have a new sustainability, resilience, and innovation office. And looking a little more detail in my comment about a, a lot of what we're doing is trying to pick the right projects. And there's a project process going on now called 
Camp for Water Climate Adaptation Master Plan that is looking at all the kind of really large regional projects to address climate change and protect us from future droughts and be also, remember, we still have to be seismically resilient also, um, that they're taking a holistic look at those projects. But there's also things that are happening immediately right now to address that. Um, some of it is we're building into our master specifications um, a lot of the uh, Envision framework um, basis so that we'll be you know, ready to go with that on projects wherever we can, you know, changing the amount of uh, recycled material in the asphalt to all sorts of those kind of technical details on things. Um, one of the biggest ones we're addressing right now, and I suspect a lot of you are also, is the state law that we have to be 50% zero emission vehicles right now, anything we buy. And I have, I've got heavy duty trucks that have to go out to you know, Lake Mead and to places, all, all sorts of places in between. How do we do that? How do we build that infrastructure right now? So that's an important issue. It's a great question. Thank you. Can I just also dovetail? Um, we have about 91% of our programs currently slated um, for sustainable development that we're doing in accordance with the Brundtland, um, United Nations Brundtland definition. Um, so um, like May, you mentioned about zero emissions. Well, we um, have zero emissions energy operations projects that we're doing. Um, it's, it's huge. 53% um, of our capital improvement projects for fiscal year 24, um, which is about $154 million currently in this year, is dedicated for rail infrastructure. So that's um, in accordance to take trucks, 750 trucks uh, um, off the road, per <laughs> truck trips, uh, and that's huge for on-dock rail um, and cargo movement. And in uh, the next 10 years, that's about 135, and we're looking at um, 1.6 billion dollars um, from that aspect. But then beyond that, um, uh, I think it's been touched on. I'd love to hear, like maybe afterwards, if you can, if you're in the stormwater harvesting and um, recycling infrastructure um, arena, I'd love to get to know you and uh, learn more about you because that's the terrain we're going to be traversing subsequent to the, the next. Uh, um, per chapter right now, um, and really that's going to be, I mean, the numbers right now that are like we're conceptually looking at, it's about $500 million um, is uh, what we're looking at. Like that's a half a billion dollars just um, around the corner, and there's so much more work, but it, we're, our focus is to be world-class sustainable developers. And it's a huge emphasis, whether it's our fleets that we need to make sure there is zero emission, whether it's pier wind, whether it's our rail, whether it's our stormwater. But the infrastructure projects that we have um, in the immediate horizon is in the realm of st uh, stormwater beyond rail. Well, unfortunately, I think we're out of time, but I, I want to thank everybody on the panel. This was great, and I think it's very fortunate for, for all of you that we went early and you were able to hear this information and you're able to, to come up to any of these panelists throughout the rest of the day to have further conversations here. So thank you, and thank you all. That was great.